Welcome to another Wisdom Pod. We have Ashok Panikar with us. He's the director at Village Idiots. We're going to talk about society, philosophy, democracy, everything in between, history. This pod is brought to you by podbury.com if you want to start your scholar podcast. Ashok, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about you and what you're up to nowadays. Firstly, thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles, for picking me out of the internet because we've never met. We've not, not been in touch, and I really was pleasantly surprised to hear from you. A little about Village Idiot Studio. As I was, as I tell most of the people who ask me, I started Village Idiot Studio primarily because after working for almost 40 years in trying to strengthen people's capacity to think critically and to manage disputes and conflicts, I have realized that the conventional ways of dealing with any of this don't work. I've also realized that our experts, our geniuses, and our thought leaders have contributed to creating this mess. So I decided that perhaps it's time to listen to those who are normally written off as idiots. And um, in a way, you can see I'm rediscovering my inner idiot. And I've decided that we need an alternative perspective about how to deal with the world. Yeah, well, it seems to me that most of society is the norm, which is why uh, democracies work in society. Democracies are for the greatest good, the greatest number. Um, so for the normal person, it does make sense. So I don't think intellectuals should reshape societies because they're a lesser number. I do think it they should just function in terms of innovation and suggesting new things, having the mass move forward slowly but surely. But as soon as you listen to an intellectual and you put his agenda to play, you will see probably mayhem in society. What do you think about that? I think you have a point, Charles. Uh, I think it, when intellectuals come into power and then they control society from the top down, it's almost certainly going to be based on the intellectual's agenda, as you said. And that kind of an agenda leads to a negative kind of elitism. And so I'm nervous about oligarchies or plutocracies, any system which is controlled by a small elite group of people. So, and I agree that the greatest good for the greatest number of people is something we should aspire for. Unfortunately, after doing this work, Charles, I'm not sure I have the answers anymore. Right. I mean, oligarchy, sure, they're causing uh, mayhem in, in uh, Russia, but um, what's more preoccupying near you and I is probably <laughs> populists uh, taking control of power, convincing crowds of lies for their own agenda, mostly their own ego, uh, as it was the case with Trump. Um, isn't that a more preoccupying uh, concern than Mr. Putin at the other end of the globe that's sort of, uh, yeah, causing big conflicts for sure and violent conflict, but isn't it more riskier to have a clown, an idiot at the power, uh, certainly one that is pretty smart at marketing and getting elected, but from anything else and uh, product wise and society advancement wise is doing pretty much the complete opposite of what people or humanity needs. Great question. And the way I look at it, uh, Charles, is that we are 21st century, we live in an extremely complex world and there are multiple dangers and there are multiple dangerous people or forces. You mentioned at one end Putin, that's one big danger. You mentioned at another end uh, populists like Trump. In India, we have Modi. Now, there are multiple forces that have created the kind of confusion and the kind of uh, vulnerability that democratic societies face. 
I call, when I teach uh, about this in my courses, I call it the perfect storm. Some people call it the poly crisis. So there are multiple crisis points that are coming together and it, it is likely to hit us in the next five or 10 or 15 years. Each of these crises has its own leaders. So for instance, um, Russia and Putin are creating a certain kind of crisis. Xi and China are creating a different kind of crisis, but it's connected. The uh, universities which have been taken over by the war in the US, that's creating a different kind of crisis. And Trump and other uh, populists are taking, uh, creating another set of crises. So you're right, there are so many of these forces, people and ideas that are threatening us today. Right. No, you you're right, and um, yeah, various actors at play. I was even wondering if Trump was anti woke, and it seems that yes is a is an obvious answer. But yeah, like you said, it's multifaceted because there are some aspects of Trump's that um, I like. I don't I don't admire for sure, but the fact that he's an entrepreneur, I think that entrepreneurs should run societies. Um, think that yeah they should have some experience in public administration as well but it should come from a private mindset um and someone coming from a product background not a sales background sales is dangerous um and marketing they should come from building something that is good at scale for their user base in my opinion now hamas and israel for example what are you Seeing in that conflict, this one seems to be one of the hardest conflict to resolve. And I work a lot with startups nowadays. Uh, Startup Nation uh, is Israel. And when I get these guests on my pond and I ask them how to resolve, it's they always answer with the same. It's very, very simple. Well, there's nothing simple in this world, especially not in this conflict. And that's instantly when I know that they're biased. I also look at their LinkedIn feed and it's full of anger. Um, and rightfully, right, if I was Israeli and I'd see my own kind get beheaded, uh, pretty sure I'd be pissed off as well. But when it seems that emotions invite themselves to a dialogue and fixing a problem rationally, it cannot bring scalable solutions. Uh, what is your take on the, the topic, conflict resolution, quote unquote, and that conflict precisely, which seems to be one of the hardest conflict to resolve in our modern times. Thank you so much for asking me that, Charles. I, I wrote an article called Growing Strawberries on Coconut Trees, which was published by the online journal Beyond Intractable. Now, my stance uh, where the Israel-Palestine conflict is one that comes out of been in the conflict resolution and peace building world for almost 30 years. And I was in Boston, for instance, for 10 years, 10 of those years. And one of the things I discovered was that every second person who was a senior uh, peace builder or conflict resolution person was running to Israel or running to Palestine to help bring Israelis and Palestinians together. There were Jews and Muslim dialogues. There were so, so much money and resources were spent over the past 30 to 40 years to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. I don't think a single conflict anywhere in the world has had so much attention, and yet it was totally useless. And the reason I say it is useless, I mean, I don't have to tell you it's useless because we can see what's going on right now. But as to what to do about it, the first thing that I would say is, and I write in the article about this, this is not a conflict between Israel and Palestine. This is part of the civilizational conflict that we are entering into. Russia against Ukraine is part of the authoritarian versus uh, democratic capitalist uh, war. It is also a uh, uh, part of the East versus West. People don't like uh, my saying this because they think it's too broad and sweeping, but sometimes things happen in a broad and sweeping ways. The uh, Israel-Palestine issue is primarily an Islamic world versus modernity 
conflict. And having worked for many years with Muslims and having supported them as a minority in India, where they are being oppressed right now, I can tell you that I believe that Islam and the Ummah, which is the uh, global brotherhood of Muslims, struggle to accept modernity and struggle to live within liberal secular states. And Israel, yeah, I'm neither a Jew nor a Muslim, and I don't have anybody in either Gaza or in Israel. So I have no bone to pick here, except I think Israel is the first thing that those who want an Islamist caliphate want to destroy. And that's extremely dangerous for what it can portend for the rest of the liberal world. The same way that we cannot let Ukraine fail, the same way that we cannot let uh, Taiwan fall to China. So what can we do? Nothing is what I say. This conflict has to play out. It's terrible to uh, listen to uh, those words, but there are some things in life. When a tsunami is coming, you can't stop the tsunami. You can't stop the tsunami. And these conflicts are like a tsunami. At the, and I can't tell you what will happen at the end. Either the uh, Muslim states will drive the Jews out of the region, or Israel will destroy a lot of the Palestinian people and create fortress. But it can never be completely safe in a region which is dominated by a billion Muslims. So I don't see any way out of this. The only thing I can say, and I write this in the book, I mean in the article, is that if there is a very strong hegemon, let's just say um, uh, hypothetically, if China comes and controls the entire Middle East and with the power of the gun, it stops the conflict and controls both Israel and uh, the Arab states, we might have a very uncomfortable and authoritarian peace. But this conflict isn't going away anytime now. And not well. The China uh, occupation seems a bit far fetched to me. Really? Israel yeah. is uh, is backed by the U.S. Um, and that would be the most likely scenario, in my opinion. I don't think even a billion Arabs cannot move Israel. They're too technologically advanced. They're too powerful. Um, right. If you just look at the stats in the in the war, it's always like ten Arabs dead for one uh, Jew. Um, and that's because they're just superior uh, in their uh, fighting capabilities, their technology, their military. The first thing that came to my mind is like, I think, yeah, not Arabs generally, but like uh, Osama bin Laden really fucked up when he he like crashed two planes in the towers, just like um, Japanese uh, fucked up real time uh, when they went to Pearl Harbor. Um, every time it's the same when you mess with, you know, a gigantic pit, pit bull and you're like this chihuahua. And China, they don't look quite aggressive to me, like historically speaking. I, I like China as a, as a country. Yes, they're authoritarian, but I think they're great at commerce. They're great at many things. Um, I do have a problem with like anything that's terrorist associated though um and it it seems to it seems to me that yeah israel and and arabs for example in in palestine i, I do think they can be able to resolve through a technological solution which might be naive but what if you know like folks like sam altman working on an agi um really drastically uh, change the face of how humanity is conducted. I mean, with Chad GPT and all, it's knowledge at the edge of her fingertips, you know. What if um, territory aren't uh, a thing anymore? What if uh, if that notion sort of dissipates with time and we get access to greater knowledge? It's probably very 
a naive to think that as a Westerner that has access to all the best technology is educated and is quote unquote comfortable via these folks on the ground that don't even have water on a day to day. But what do you, do you think that AI could play a role in how the world's dynamics and uh, foreign relations operate? Wow. Uh, Charles, I can't see that far into the future right now. But I, I can imagine a world in 100, 200, 400 years where AI completely radically changes the frames of reference of human existence. I can completely see that. Anything is possible. 200 years ago, nobody could imagine something like the internet or the kind of globalization we have now. So having said that, I do have to say that whether it's Sam Altman or the uh, next a uh, bunch of geniuses who come, technological geniuses, they have to take into consideration not just the material factors like land, water, uh, and other resources. They also have to take into consideration identity. They have to take into consideration ideology. Now, uh, I worked for many years uh, with fundamentalists, Muslims and Hindus, and even evangelic evangelical Christians. And one of the things I realized is on the surface, they are fighting about land, buildings, and laws. But deep down, it's none of those matter. It is about their sense of identity. This is who we are, and this is our vision for the world. For instance, when I really pushed the Hindus and Muslims to try to negotiate a coexistence, the Hindus told me very clearly after it took, took them a year and a half to tell me this. They said, this land is ours, that is India, and Muslims are foreigners. We will be, we will be happy only when Muslims become second-class citizens. They're very clear because they are foreigners. Okay. And the Muslims said, Ashok, and this took them more than a year to uh, confessed to me. Ashok, they want peace. But peace is impossible unless the whole world becomes Islamic. So this is this is the key for me. You see the uh, Harvard uh, MIT model of um, principal negotiation or uh, mutual gains theory is based on interests. Interests of different groups. But when that uh, has to deal with particularly the non-Western, Eastern ideas of identity and religion and family and tribe, it collapses. The Western, uh, as I said, MIT Harvard model of negotiation completely breaks down in the traditional world where they say, we don't care. We are more interested in our genes, our tribe prospering. We are willing to we are willing to starve in order for that to happen. So anything can happen in the next uh, 50, 100 years, and I, I don't know what the future will be. But whatever happens, either it is, uh, as I said, authoritarian, and I, China was just an example. It could be US, it could be anyone else. Either it's authoritarian or technological world where they can figure out how to stop our drive towards identity and ideology. Right. And it's also curious to see why there's resentment after the Arab nations vs. like Germany that conducted the Holocaust nowadays. It's it's really curious to to see that in play in the narrative. And it seems to me that yeah, these big powers can convince anyone of anything they can manipulate the the narrative how can people nowadays not fall into disinformation and gather objective information and think critically thank you now you're talking about something that i've been working on since 1988 when i started teaching my first courses in critical thinking and i think you see with the information revolution we have come slaves of information and we have 
misunderstood information for knowledge. And we have misunderstood the acquisition of information, information and the development of knowledge for wisdom. So critical thinking has nothing to do with information. Information is there. I can access a lot of it. Critical thinking has to do with the way I process the information, the way I build knowledge, which is interpreting the information that everyone else has. So if you and I watch the same movie or read the same book, we are getting the same information. But the knowledge that Charles develops out of that book is going to be very different from the knowledge that I develop. And that is where Charles is either more uh, wise than I am or I am better uh, equipped to deal with that. So really, I would say the short answer for this, and there's no simple way of doing this, and at scale, it's very difficult to do it. If you have ways I can do this at scale, I would love your ideas. But the short way of saying this is, we, we must stop trying to learn the what of things. We must start learning how to think. If our entire educational system will tell you what to think. What are the uh, capital cities of the world? What was the history of World War II? It gives you data and facts. That doesn't teach us how to think. And so I, I would say, the, if I had another 50 years, meaning if the world had another 50 years, I would say, start teaching critical thinking from first grade and do not let someone graduate high school unless they know how to use their mind. It's like the most fantastic tool, but we use it to store information. We don't use it to interpret and wrestle with contradictions and dilemmas, come up with a modest but wise response. I say modest because whatever I do, I may be wrong. And I have to be willing to recognize every time I say something that that could be wrong. Do you feel that Wikipedia and having various contributors to an article can bring uh, objectivity? Or do you think there's still some form of bias there? What would be the ideal system? Would it be a human community of many editors with an AI on the back end reviewing everything? I, I, I think you may be right, the latter one. I think you need human editors, not because they know more, AI can know more, but because there are, there are always biases. Algorithms have bias, we know that. So a human uh, editor who can look at, say, a paper and evaluate it for bias, and not one human editor, multiple human editors working together which is what used to happen in the old uh, mainstream newspapers, your Washington Post or New York Times, where uh, you had senior editors who would look and test for bias. Now, of course, they can also be biased, but without that, it's an old fashioned system, but I can't see how we could uh, eliminate bias without that. Love that. Ashok, thank you for today. Where can people find out more about you? My website is www.villageidiot.studio, not org, not com, villageidiot.studio. And my email address is even simpler, villageidiotstudio, one word, at gmail.com. So it's villageidiotstudio at gmail.com. Feel free to get in touch with me. I'd love to have conversations the way I envy Charles. He has conversations with wonderful, uh, wonderful, wonderful variety of people. I, I would be happy to hear from people. And Charles, thank you so much for the invitation. Last question, Charles. Where can people see this video? Uh, 